you know, delighted you know, to welcome you to uh, the university this evening for the, the, the latest in our IFP, Institute for Public Policy and Professional Practice lecture series. And I'm delighted myself this evening in particular to be able to invite someone that I've known for, I think, well over 20 years, um, who I think has been a leading commentator on the state of higher education throughout that time. Uh, Peter, all these dates and times are approximate because I can't remember precisely what he told me as we were walking over. Uh, but Peter served for 13 or 14 years as the editor of the Times Higher. Um, he then actually spent almost six years as Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of Leeds. And then, rather to my surprise, actually, when we spoke, I hadn't realized it was quite so long, I had the same in my own career, I guess, that he had, um, had also spent 13 years as the Vice Chancellor of Kingston University in London. Um, more recently, Peter, well, Peter has always been known for his journalism, for his editorials, in particular, at the moment, he's known, in my view, actually, for the work he writes for The Guardian, um, and particularly the work of The Guardian Online, and uh, most weeks there's something there which is well worth your know, reading and well worth absorbing. Um, and also, of course, he is a, a fellow at uh, the Institute of Education you know, in London. So Peter is one of the most eminent commentators on what's happening in higher education. Um, I, he also, I think, has a very honest and open view about what's happening in higher education, and from my perspective, one of the reasons I particularly like Peter's work is that ideologically, I don't think we're too far apart as well. That always helps, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, absolute pleasure. Just in terms of the, the way in which we'll run this evening, Peter will speak for something in the order of 40 minutes. For my colleagues in here, that's Peter's 40 minutes, not my definition of 40 minutes. Yeah. Uh, we'll then have the opportunity for some Q&A. We'll finish in here at about 7 o'clock. And then everybody, and particularly our guests, are very welcome to join us you know, for a bite of food and so on outside afterwards. So, ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure and privilege, Professor Peter Scott. Thank you, John, for that welcome, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm very impressed by the audience that uh, uh, have uh, come here at Edge Hill University. Um, this, of course, is the obligatory marketing. All universities have to leave this slide on the screen as long as possible, um, but I'll, I'll move it quickly. Um, that's my title this evening, um, Higher Education 2025, approximately 10 years or a bit more ahead. Um, will it actually look pretty much like it does now? Will it be a familiar landscape? Or will it be a kind of another country, a place we just simply don't recognize? Um, so that's what I want to talk about. Um, I'll probably drift off the topic, as always happens occasionally, um, but I promise you I'll come back to that uh, at the end. Um, and I want to think for a moment of three possible futures. One is everything will change. Um, the, the phrase that's often used is paradigm shift. Um, come on to that in a moment. It's the phrase that Lord Brown himself, in his report, when he introduced his report at his press conference, claimed his report represented a paradigm shift. The other possibility, second possibility, is of course there'll be lots and lots of changes in higher education, as there will be lots and lots of changes in the economy and society and culture. But there'll be these kind of subterranean big, big changes. They won't be kind of things taking place on the political surface so much. And the third possibility is actually there won't be much change at all. I mean, universities are actually pretty resilient institutions. Um, and over the years, we've been quite good, I think, at absorbing change. Um, uh, politicians impose various reform programs on us, and we kind of welcome them, or not, as the case may be. Um, but we kind of absorb that change, and not a great deal perhaps changes, or it, not quite the things that the ministers who uh, announced the change actually always intended. Um, and I'm going to illustrate this by putting up the pictures of three people. Um, Thomas Kuhn was a philosopher of science, American philosopher of science. He wrote a famous book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Um, and he made the contrast between what he called normal science, things sort of pegging along, incrementally changing and getting better, to what he described as absolute paradigm shifts. Now, he was a physicist originally, so he was thinking very much in terms of the shift from 
Newton's view of physics to kind of Einstein's view of physics. Really big changes like that that fundamentally change. I, mean, I actually interviewed him when I was a journalist um, uh, in uh, MIT where he was a professor. Second person I want to put up on the screen is the person I also interviewed when I was a journalist. It's Ferdinand Brodel, the French historian, um, whose most famous work was called The Mediterranean and the Mediterranean World in the Age of Philip II. And what was interesting about this book was that Philip II didn't feature in it very much. It was all about kind of demography and geography and climate and, and social change. And he made this famous distinction between structural change, which is what he was mainly interested in, and the history of events, which he, I think he meant in a rather derogatory way, the kind of things that rippled along the surface uh, and appeared to be very significant at the time, but in retrospect perhaps weren't. I interviewed him as well. I still have the tape of my interview. I'm very proud of that. Um, um, I taped it because I didn't feel my French was good enough without a tape. Um, and the final person, I never met him, I'm afraid. He died, I think, <laughs> before, I, perhaps when I was very young, not be quite before I was born. Um, uh, he was an Italian author, and he wrote a famous book called The Leopard. Um, and if you haven't read the book, you've probably seen the movie with Burt Lancaster in it, um, uh, which is actually a pretty good movie, and he was pretty good in it. Um, and one of the characters um, in uh, this novel, uh, Tancredi, who was the nephew of the, the Duke, I think, um, uh, came up with this phrase that things must change so that things can stay the same. Now, he was talking about the unification of Italy in 1859, 1860, and he was saying, we have to go along with this new kind of uh, Piedmont kind of ascendancy, a unified kingdom. He was from Sicily, of course, because this will allow the social structures in Sicily to remain essentially unchanged. So we accept a lot of apparently radical political change so that actually our own position can remain relatively unchanged. So I've used those as kind of illustrations, you know, just to make it a bit more lively, perhaps, or a bit more human, of actually possibly some of the changes, uh, options that are facing higher education. But let me get on to really what I want to talk about in more detail. So I want to talk about six things. I want to briefly just sketch out what kind of higher education system we have, because often it's important to recognise just where we are. Second, I'm going to talk about the reform of English higher education. And I emphasize English because most of the things that we actually are concerned about, perhaps obsess about, actually aren't happening in Scotland and they're not happening much in Wales. Then I want to talk about the short-term effects. I mean, what happened immediately after these reforms? So it's really what happened in the last four years. Then I want to look at unfinished business, and there's a lot of unfinished business, I can tell you. Um, then I want to come back to the kind of, the question I set myself at the beginning, familiar landscape or another country, and offer you a few <coughs> conclusions and reflections. So let me start with higher education in the UK. This is very brief, and these figures are actually, I mean, they're, they're very rounded figures. Um, but we approximately have 2.5 million students, I mean, um, actually a bit more. And there are four European countries that have more than 2 million students. One is Germany, second is France, the third is the UK, and the fourth, interestingly, is Poland. Um, not Italy, not Spain. So we're one of the really big players in European terms in higher education. But actually, this has all happened quite recently, and this is a point I want to come back to. Um, uh, at the turn of the century, we only had 1.5 million. So there's been an awful lot of growth, which has really been quite recent. We have a lot of non-UK students. We're a very international system. Um, not quite as international in terms of proportions as the Australians, but substantially more international than the Americans, for example. The Americans have more international students, but of course they have many, many more students than we do all together. Um, so we have, getting on for 400,000 um, international students, um, most of them outside the UK, and I think the reason for that is we're quite keen to recruit people from outside the, e sorry, the EU. We're quite keen to, charge, to recruit people from outside the EU, 
because we could charge them high fees, um, well, other EU students are not so desirable. I mean, highly desirable in education or academic terms, but if you talk to finance directors, they're not so interested in EU students. Um, but it's an important point to recognise we're a very international system. We're international also in terms of our staffing as well. Um, occasionally, I think we sort of fall into this pattern of thinking we're very insular and rather xenophobic. We're actually, we're not in higher education. We're very much the reverse. What are the most popular subjects? Well, they're not history, the subject I studied. They're not chemistry. That probably doesn't surprise you. Um, they're these subjects. Business and management is the most popular subject. Admittedly, a pretty broad church. Secondly, subjects allied to medicine. And if you pop medicine in there as well, I think it would actually pip business and management to the number one subject. Education. And so it goes on. Now, I'm very pleased to say that I think Edge Hill is pretty strong in all those three subjects. Um, but it's interesting, across the system as a whole, that we are actually a pretty vocational system and a pretty professional system. I am not talking just about so-called post-92 universities, the former polytechnics and colleges. I'm talking also about the traditional universities. They're also quite strongly vocational and professional in their focus. And these have been the big growth subjects. The participation rate, very broadly speaking, it's slightly more complicated than this, the proportion of school leavers who go on to some form of higher education is kind of nudging 50%. It never hasn't quite reached the 50% that Tony Blair some time ago set as a kind of target, I think, in the, I think it was the Labour Party manifesto for the 2001 election. Um, but we're getting quite close. And of course, Scotland, the Scots will constantly remind you of this, they're way ahead of us in England on this. They already have more than 50% of young people going on to higher education. And they would construct lots of kind of interesting theories about how superior Scotland was and how much more it respected education generally. Um, and the final point, we have 165 higher education institutions, um, but the majority of those are now universities, um, which <coughs> used not to be the case. After all, we had a binary distinction between universities, polytechnics, and other institutions. Um, and the great majority of students now study in multi-faculty universities. Uh, and I think that's created certain problems. I probably can't go into too much detail about it, but I think if you're a monotechnic, I come from a monotechnic, the Institute of Education. Other education is a pretty broad subject. Um, and we're giving up. We're actually merging with UCL uh, at the end of the year. Um, and actually, I think life is relatively uncomfortable if you're a specialist institution. Unless you're the Royal College of Art and have negotiated some wonderful kind of sweetheart deal where you get really superior funding. So that's a, a rough pen portrait of higher education. Now, what about some of the characteristics? Well, we're clearly a mass system. I mean, mass is an ambiguous word, I think, in English. I mean, it's, it's a good thing, but also it's a bad thing. Um, but clearly we are a mass system. As I said, we're one of the four biggest in Europe. Um, but because it's happened relatively recently, my second point, um, I think we maintain many of the features that are characteristic of a more selective and more elite system. Um, so, for instance, correctly, I think, we care very much about contact with students in a way that perhaps in a large American state university, they would not worry so much about that direct personal contact with students. We also obsess about wastage, about the proportion of people who complete. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's good that people succeed, but maybe it's bad if we don't give people a chance if we're not pretty confident they're going to succeed. Um, so that's another example, I think, of an, a kind of elite characteristic. A third characteristic, and I think this is a good one, is that we believe very strongly in all universities the research and teaching belong together. Um, the second point I've already covered, I think the explanation for this is that the expansion has been comparatively recent. So in our minds, I think we're often recalling 
a system, not when we were students, I mean, we recognize it's different since then, um, but a system which was actually much smaller in scale. The third point I've also already mentioned passing, we're a unified system. We don't have a binary distinction between universities and other kinds of institution of higher education, which of course, for example, in Germany they still maintain. They have universities and they have Fachhochschulen, um, rather like our former polytechnics. Um, but of course, we're not all the same and we're quite a differentiated system. Um, we're differentiated, certainly in terms of these dreadful league tables we all have to worry so much about. But also, if we're honest, we're differentiated in terms of research intensity, in terms of the students we actually address and try and meet the needs of. Um, in terms of our regional position, I think where you are in the country is quite important. So there's lots of differentiation in the system. So though we're a unified system, I think it's a mistake to think it's a kind of one-size-fits-all. I think sometimes politicians both, part, both major parties sort of feel we're all trying to make one size fits all in higher education. And I think that's actually a travesty. Fourth point, we are on an, an excellent system. We're certainly an excellent system in terms of research. Now, I take all these league tables, particularly global league tables, with a pinch of salt. But they tell you something. And after the US, the UK has most highly ranked universities in the world. Um, and if you look at cit citation indices of publications by academic staff in UK universities, it tells the same story, essentially. Are we so excellent in teaching? Well, I think we'd like to think we were, but I'm not so sure. Um, that's something which there's less clear evidence about on a kind of international comparative basis and it's probably pretty difficult, honestly, to have evidence on an international basis, which is why I worry about kind of uh, PISA scores for school children, school pupils, um, which show that uh, we're lagging behind South Korea or lagging behind Finland. The very fact that those two countries both do very well in school performance, but are actually utterly different in their approaches to education, demonstrates the simple point that context, national context and cultural assumptions are really very important here. And finally, well, we're, we're certainly, we have always been a public system of higher education, but we've never been a state system. We've never ha had state institutions in the way they've had in most other parts of Europe, where academic staff were civil servants and universities were actually owned by the state and run pretty directly by the ministry. Now, actually, if you look at the rest of Europe, it never quite worked like that. I mean, universities had a very high degree of autonomy within that. And sometimes the very fact they were part of the state bureaucracy gave them a greater bargaining opportunity than we've had. Um, but maybe it's given us some flexibility in terms of deciding our own futures and making our own futures. But I think we were always seen as public in a broader sense, public interest, public ethos, public values. Um, but maybe we're shifting and becoming rather more private. I'm going to come on later to whether this distinction between public and private is still a valid one, um, but it's one that's widely used. Um, I think we're certainly all becoming entrepreneurial, which is the word we all love nowadays. We're all entrepreneurial universities, whether we're public or private. So that's a quick sort of sketch as I see it. I mean, I've left an awful lot out, but I'm just trying to capture some of the major characteristics of higher education in the UK. Oops. Sorry, and this, th these are the key changes um, which I suppose have taken place. Let me just go through them quite quickly. Um, I've already mentioned the very rapid growth and relatively recent growth in student numbers. Research, and I'll come again onto this, um, there's a much stronger emphasis on research excellence. I mean, we're all waiting in a few weeks' time for the results of the research excellence framework to how, find out how you did in terms of the latest rankings. Um, and in practice, there's a very high degree of concentration of funding for research in a limited number of institutions. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to emphasize the impact of research and enterprise and engagement. 
And I think there's a certain tension potentially between those two objectives. The third thing is extremely strong. The sense that we now should treat students as customers. Some of us resist that precise word because we think it's too simple a description of the relationship between students and their teachers. Um, but it's a common word nevertheless. And of course we have the National Student Survey, another league table we live or die by. We are forced to publish key information sets so that we can, students can make more informed choices about which university to apply to. And of course the media have a very, very substantial presence here in producing good university guides and league tables. Everyone, most media outlets are now doing that. And finally, a key change is a shift towards what is usually called rather euphemistically cost sharing. In other words, shifting the burden from the taxpayer to the student, or more accurately, to the graduate, by charging higher fees. And this process started under the previous Labour government. It was the previous Labour government that first charged fees, originally at the level of £1,000 a year, then it was increased to £3,000 a year, and that process, of course, has been continued by the coalition government. So although in a, the pre-election months there appear to be big separations and big differences between the parties on these sort of issues, in practice there's been quite a high degree of consensus. Not a consensus I personally share, but nevertheless it's been there. Okay, so that's, that's UK higher education. Let me come on to the reforms of English higher education. Well, what was the package, the reform package? Well, fees were tripled from 3,000 to up to 9,000. Um, uh, actually, 6,000. You can only charge up to 9,000 pounds if you have a, an access agreement to show that you are trying to reach out to students and doing lots of good things in terms of access. Um, that wasn't the original plan. The Brown Committee actually recommended there should be no fees cap but did have an alternative mechanism by which if you charge more and more, you'd have to pay more and more back into a kind of pool that would be used for scholarships. Balancing that, all full-time students, no means test, are entitled to a loan to pay their fees. So you could still say that higher education is free at the point of use. Looming over you, of course, is the shadow of debt, but at the point, when you access higher education, you don't have to pay for it. And actually, for the first time, a limited number of part-time students were also given access to loans to pay tuition. Um, the great majority weren't, though, and I'm going to come on to that, because I think the key group that are probably been most disadvantaged by this reform are part-time students. There is now no funding from the Higher Education Funding Council for Arts and Humanities subjects, for the very practical reason that the fee now covers more than the sum total of the hefty funding for those subjects plus the smaller fee. So actually, in a way, it's, a diff it's just a collateral effect of the higher fee. But of course, many people in the arts and humanities and social science have seen this as clear evidence of the philistinism of the government, of its opposition to the humanities, of its highly utilitarian instrumental focus. I think that's probably a bit unfair. But of course the result of that is that the Funding Council um, only gives funding, direct funding now, for obviously research, quality research, which is distributed on a very selective basis, as you know, um, and also for the more expensive subjects, science, technology, engineering, medicine or mathematics, there's always some doubt about what the final M stands for. Medics insist it stands for medicine. Um, initially, there was a student number cap, um, but that's been progressively removed. It was first removed for students with what I would broadly call very good A-level results, then for students with kind of less good A-level results, and now, from next year, for all students at all. I'm going to come back to that about how really true that is. 
but it looks like a kind of freeing up of the system because we've actually lived with student number controls for more than 20 years. Um, and finally, private providers were encouraged to enter the market. So there's no longer going to be a monopoly for the established institutions like Edge Hill, new private providers, sometimes for profit providers could actually enter the market and the threshold would be lowered. Now I've mentioned two there in brackets. One is BPP University College, simply because they are a, a for-profit institution, um, a subsidiary of the Apollo Group in the United States, um, uh, mainly concerned with law and accountancy, but expanding their operations quite fast. Uh, and the other is Regents University in London, which is a for not, not for profit institution, and therefore actually rather like the rest of us, if I can put it like that. So that was the reform package. I think there are two major interpretations of this. I mean, one was sort of Lord Brown's original interpretation. This was paradigm shift. We were moving from a kind of broadly public system of higher education to a kind of market system of higher education. Both those terms were not terribly well defined. Um, uh, so the removal of the student numbers cap was evidence of that liberalization move towards the market. Um, uh, possibly the removal of the fees cap in the future, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, perhaps the possibility of the closure or takeover of failing institutions. We haven't actually seen much of that, but that's, that would be characteristic of a true market. I mean, um, uh, and I think you have to ask questions about whether you've really got a market operating if no one can fail in it. So that was one interpretation. And the second interpretation, I think, was the interpretation that most senior people in universities, including most vice chancellors, clung to, um, a kind of justification of cruel necessity. It wasn't that they necessarily believed in higher fees. In fact, personally, they were probably strongly opposed to higher fees, but they felt there was no option. The only options were actually either cuts in student numbers or else a cut in the unit of resource, the income per student, which would, of course, hit quality. So in the absence of anything else, and the, uh, anything else, of course, would be increase in taxation, but I think no party has shown much appetite for increasing taxes. Um, the only alternative was actually getting a higher student contribution. And I think it's still, you know, we've oscillated between these two interpretations of the significance of the reforms. So what were the short-term effects? Well, what immediately happened next? Well, the first year the high fees were introduced, Perhaps not surprising, there was a very sharp decline in student demand. Or perhaps students got in early when it was going to be much cheaper. Um, but that's been followed by a recovery. Um, broadly speaking, back to the same level of demand that we had before. So it appears on the face of it that charging higher fees did not actually put off students. I would say it's early days to actually draw that conclusion. And there's one group that was particularly hit, where demand collapsed and it has remained low, and that's part-time students. And that's for the obvious reason. The great majority of part-time students could, no long, could still not get any access to loans to pay their tuition fees, but their tuition fees in nearly every case had been increased pro rata to the increase in full-time students, so they had to pay themselves out of their own pockets these much higher fees. So not surprisingly, demand declined. Then, of course, there was, which I've already mentioned, the privileging of students with high grades. Um, it's extraordinary the faith we now place in kind of A-level results, it's a kind of gold standard. Um, uh, many of the people who believe in this are precisely the same people who criticised A-levels and saw it as kind of declining standards year on year. Um, and I think there's a certain incompatibility between privileging high-grade students in terms of access to higher education and insisting, well, we still believe in widening participation. We're still committed to it. I wonder if you can square that circle. The third thing that happened next was there was quite a differential pattern of winners and losers in the first couple of years of the new fee regime. They weren't the obvious people. I mean, for example, the University of Southampton suffered quite a rapid decline in its first year intake, despite the fact it was a Russell Group University. 
And equally, there are some post-92 universities where their recruitment held up very well. I think there's evidence now that's sort of settling down um, and we're returning to a more stable conditions. Then league table rankings became much more important. Um, we all started to spend a lot more money on marketing um, and branding and those things. Um, so those issues like league, where you are on the league table, what your recent score was in the National Student Survey, these moved centre stage in a very dramatic kind of way. Um, I mentioned brand wars. I mean, I'm not sure if we're wars exactly, <clears throat> but we certainly in invest more money in, in developing our brands than we would have been conceivable 20 years before. Um, and some of us even tried recruitment incentives, you know, the free iPad for every hundredth person or whatever. Um, and the fourth consequence is one that's not mentioned very much. And that is that there's been a complete flip over. We used to think that it was the post-92 universities that were most dependent on public funding. And the major research universities were least dependent on public funding. They had lots of other income. When I was flipped over, the institutions that are most dependent on public funding, direct public funding, are now, of course, those institutions that have the highest research grades and the most research money, uh, but also those that have high-cost subjects in science, technology, and engineering. And although, of course, those subjects are taught in the post-92 sector, there's still quite a heavy concentration in the traditional universities. So those are some of the things that sort of happen next. What about unfinished business? Well, there's the issue that's been raised about whether we should remove the fees cap entirely, that you can charge more than 9,000, and you can charge whatever you want. And uh, certainly the Vice Chancellor of Oxford and Cambridge constantly say that actually it, it's a lot more expensive. You know, it's cost, we're making a loss on 9,000 pounds. I'm not sure I believe them. Um, then there's been some arguments up. That the second and third points are actually linked. The problem is that because students access loans, and these, of course, actually are public funding. They're accounted in a different way, but they come through the student loans company. Um, and because the terms are quite generous, um, it does mean that a proportion of students will never pay their loans back in full. That was always accepted by the government, but it thought the level would, might be 28 to 30 percent. And that was factored into the kind of their arguments with the Treasury about how this was a sustainable. Uh, system, new system in financial terms. It's now very clear that that unfair to call it a default rate, but non-repayment rate will be much higher. It's actually getting perilously close to half. And that probably means that in terms of public resources, publicly generated resources, we are now putting more into higher education than we were in the old tax-based system. So are we really cost sharing in any real sense. We are, of course, inflicting quite high levels of debt on graduates, which will hang over them. But given that a lot of it will not be repaid, have we really saved anything? There's an argument for it saying we're actually spending more public money on higher education than we were before. So if you see this in terms of deficit reduction or austerity policies, it's not making a great contribution, I'd have to say. Um, and then finally, I've another bit of loose end unintended consequence is the student number cap. Well, on the face of it, it's been removed entirely. But of course, we know that no university would be allowed to recruit any student at once on any programme at once. There must be some control here. But the control will be exercised indirectly. There'll be kind of eligibility criteria, quality thresholds and so on. And this is all a bit unclear at the moment. But there's going to be something like that. It's never going to be open house when you're actually accessing public money. And it would be irresponsible if that was the situation. And then there's some other bits of unintended business, unintended consequences. We haven't worked out whether the funding council is just simply there to top up the money. You know, if you've got a more expensive subject, they top it up to whatever, above the fee level, to whatever you need. 
Or are they expected to make a more strategic use of this resource? I think universities are kind of assuming that it's going to be top up and rather undifferentiated. But I think there'll be strong pressures from government, from any government, to Hefke to say, look, we've got a national agenda in relation to higher education. You're still spending a lot of money on higher education and we expect you to use your funding strategically to promote those objectives. Then another bit of unfinished business is what I call perhaps rather unfairly, the invasion of the for-profit sector. Well, I think the jury is very much out about whether in fact many for-profit providers will pile into the higher education market or whether they will remain what they are still today, a relatively peripheral uh, contribution to the sector. I just don't think we know that yet. Then there's the issue of what is often called better regulation, but that's a euphemism for more regulation, um, nearly always. And there are going to be real issues. If you have a more liberalised system, real issues in terms of the misuse of public money, and you can be sure the Public Accounts Committee of the House of Commons will be onto this, it's already onto this issue, of those institutions, private institutions that seem to be getting their students to access a lot of public money, um, there have been kind of references to some colleges being rather like cash machines. Um, and then there's like issue, a whole set of issues in relation to quality. Um, uh, should public money be used to fund what might be seen as rubbish programs, quite simply? So I think the pressure to regulate more will become quite strong. Then I think there's a kind of gathering crisis of governance. And I don't mean by that simply the fact that so more vice chancellors seem to be getting sacked these days than was the case, um, although that's true. Um, I think we have to ask some quite interesting questions. If we're going to move from essentially a kind of a public interest system where governing bodies, and one of the other things I do part time is to chair a governing body of a university, whether we see ourselves as sort of mainly as trustees, but of course offering advice and, and, and making certain interventions, but if we're going to see it as a market system, do we have to see governing bodies in a much more active way, as kind of sort of energetic decision-making kind of boards of directors? Um, and that's not decided. And I think most vice chancellors hate the idea that we're going to move towards the second. Um, and when I was a vice chancellor, I would have felt exactly the same. Now I'm on the other side, of course. I'm, <laughs> I still no, I still feel exactly the same. Um, then, of course, there's constitutional change. Um, well, we avoided uh, Scotland going independent by, I mean, not by whisker, but by not by that much, after all. Um, and now we're going to have devolution max, whatever that's going to be. Um, and that's going to have reverberations, I think, in Wales and in the English regions. And we just don't know at this stage how it's going to play out. And then who knows? We might leave the European Union. I hope not, but, you know, we might do. So there's lots of potential change there which have bit, could have big impacts. So there's a lot of unintended consequences, un unfinished business in relation to these reforms. Right, coming back to a familiar landscape or another country. I referred to this at the start, and you can think about this at two levels, the, kind of all the agitation on the political surface. And that's what we spend all our time agonising about, you know, will Labour reduce fees to £6,000, will something else happen, you know, we worry about these things. Um, if we're going to have higher forms of regulation, what's it going to be? Do we need a higher education conduct authority, like we have a financial conduct authority nowadays? Um, and so on. And then there's the big, big changes beneath the surface. Demography. I mean, do we have a young population or an ageing population? Not just nationally, but perhaps in our regions. What about the impact of technology? And not just the impact of learning technologies, but the impact of all technologies, perhaps on institutions themselves and how they're organised. Then it's often said we live in a knowledge society, but, but what do we mean by that? What kind of knowledge society? Is it a kind of a high skill society? Is it simply just a data, a mass data society? Um, and then there's the prospects for or limits to growth. I mean, how big will higher education come? And then finally, this kind of geopolitical turbulence. I mean, Syria, Iraq, Hong Kong, there's an awful lot happening in the world, and that's going to impact on us, not simply in terms of international student recruitment, but in many, many other, perhaps more fundamental ways. And then to think of two others, forget the word discourse. I'm regretting I used the word discourse. Now it's an awful word. But once we used to be very keen on 
postmodernism. We didn't always use this word, but we thought that, you know, everything's going to become very transgressive, everything's very fluid, everything's very reflective, um, uh, um, f lots of fuzzy boundaries. And one that I will mention is that we still persist in using the public and the private as if these are very easy terms to define anymore. But in a world where you have a lot of companies that are private companies undoubtedly, but actually very highly dependent on public funding, and you have public agencies which are acting in a highly kind of market-like way, does this distinction make any sense? So that's one, one view. And the other view, which I suppose is the dominant one, called rather pejoratively again, I suppose, neoliberalism, that kind of markets are the solution to most things. Markets are the solution mainly to everything. Um, uh, so we have to see the student as the customer. We have to see research, we have to measure its usefulness in terms of its impact, its use uh, in a fairly immediate way. We have to emphasize the right to manage, of course. You're familiar with all these kind of discourses. So I want to talk about six things, and I'll, I, I think I probably need to speed up a bit, so I'll, I'll go through them quickly. Um, first is prospects for growth. Um, how big is the higher education system going to be? Well, there are arguments on the favour of growth, that it's got to get bigger. That we are a knowledge society and we have to be globally competitive. And we can't indulge in a race to the bottom. We can't actually have lower wages than low-wage economies. So the only way we can be successful is by having high-value-added skills. And if we're going to have high value skills, we have to have a very strong higher education system to provide that. And then there's a second pro-growth argument, which is about life chances and graduate lifestyles. The idea that to be a fully kind of emancipated citizen in the kind of advanced society that Britain now is, you probably do have to have some experience of higher education. Otherwise, you're kind of out of lots of things. But then there's sort of anti-growth things. There's the tuition fees. I mean, what are the long-term impacts of that going to be? I think sometimes ch ch big changes like that seep quite gradually into the kind of public consciousness or the individual consciousness. What's the impact going to be when the impression of high levels of graduate debt gets more and more entrenched? Even if sometimes it's a bit of an illusion, but it's there, hitting people in the face. We don't really know yet. I think it's good. Then there's the issue of chronic recession. Well, we're coming out of recession, but we know that recession is something that can happen. Um, and we know that it's had an impact on levels of employment. Um, and particularly, there's been a lot of press coverage about the impact on graduate employment. Often, students are told it's not worth going to higher education. You know, it's not going to pay off. Now, actually, that's wrong, fundamentally. But nevertheless, that kind of language is around quite strongly. And there apparently are other alternative, non-graduate um, uh, pathways. I mean, there's barely a political party that doesn't go on about apprenticeships. They don't really know quite what they mean by apprenticeships, but they go on about apprenticeships a lot. And they basically mean something to different to what we do. Now, I'm not sure that's remotely accurate, because it seems to me most forms of advanced education, whether they're called apprenticeships or called academic degrees, all belong in the same kind of world, but still. And then there's the issue of the kind of, what I call perhaps rather melodramatic, the death of the public. I mean, do we believe in public values anymore? Do we believe in issues of solidarity and so on, that we have lots and lots of things in common? Um, and if those values decline, and I think it's clear evidence in the last 25 years, 30 years, those values have declined, and social attitudes demonstrated quite clearly. People 30 years ago thought much more in those terms than we do now. What impact is that going to have on us? Uh, the future shape and structure of higher education. Well, what's interesting about higher education is that the pattern of institutions has remained pretty much unchanged. Okay, Edge Hill now has university, like Kingston now has university, although we both kept Edge Hill and Kingston, unlike some other places. Um, but the same pattern of institutions that was created in the 1960s is still around. And that's half a century ago. So on the face of it, this is an incredibly stable system stable industry. How many other industri industrial sectors is that true of? Well, there are some actually, but not many. Um, 
So what might happen next? Well, one is the one that I think most of us are betting on, frankly. You know, we can't call them a cartel, I suppose we'll get into trouble with the, um, uh, you know, in terms of competition law. Um, but we want something kind of, we don't want to compete too much with each other. And we want to emphasize the kind of solidarity across the system. Um, so there will continue to be a kind of range of reputations, ambitions, but it would be managed, it would be controlled. We will still belong all in the same sort of world. Um, then there's the second possibility, the slow death, or perhaps it's going to be the rapid death of public higher education. Um, uh, this is what many of the opponents of the government's reforms are worried about. Um, but again, it's not quite clear who are going to be the winners and losers in this kind of brave new world of the market. Um, and that's a problem for all politicians, including politicians who are really keen on markets. Because politicians usually have a keen idea that they should have a stake in all this. You know, they have an idea of what outcomes they want to see. And if the market delivers the wrong sort of outcomes, they're going to tweak it in various ways so it kind of gets back to delivering the right kind of outcome. Then the possibility is that the kind of Russell Group, not the Russell Group literally, I mean, my, but those kind of universities, the major research intensive universities that are always at the top of league tables, that they would become a kind of premier division, you know, kind of Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool, Everton uh, kind of clubs, and the rest of us will be, well, the championship or maybe even lower, who knows. Um, and another possibility is that actually we will see a really substantial invasion by private providers. Um, and they will have a big impact on the system. I think none of that's pretty clear, none of that's really clear at the moment. Funding, which is the issue we obsess about, and I'm going to go through this quite briefly. Um, what's the case for cost sharing? Well, there's the case which is the f basically that we have low levels of, of public funding. I mean, we spend 50% below the OECD average on higher education, and we spend only uh, we spend much, much less than, for example, the Nordic countries. Um, uh, but at the same time, we don't have substantial amounts of private higher education as they have in the US or in Japan. So what's the alternative? You know, we have to actually get the students to pay more. We have need to have higher. Then, of course, there's an ideological dimension to this. Of course, some people think this is a good thing. I mean, they believe in the market. They distrust state action fundamentally. Um, so they think cost sharing is not only necessary, it's kind of moral. Um, and it actually makes students more committed uh, to their higher education. Um, uh, and then there's a similar argument, put particularly, I think, by the major research universities, that we have to compete with Harvard and Stanford. You know, Oxford and Cambridge aren't trying to compete with Kingston, or probably with Edge Hill, but they are trying to compete with Harvard and Stanford and Berkeley. Um, and they need the levels of funding that those institutions enjoy. And frankly, if the government can't cough up that money, someone's going to have to, and that's going to be the students. That's why vice chancellors of Oxford and Cambridge always demand their fees should be much higher. And then there's, of course, the case against. I mean, we don't really know what the impact on access is going to be long term, um, particularly on people who are going to be low earners, although paradoxically, they're the people who aren't going to have to pay back their student loans. Um, part time, as I've already mentioned. And, the whole issue of de debt aversion. I think we feel we've moved from a society which really worried about taking on too much debt to one that doesn't care about it at all. We, we live with really high levels of personal debt. I mean, it's interesting, actually, the big problem is not state debt in this country, it's actually astronomical levels of personal debt. Um, so maybe we don't worry about risk, debt aversion anymore. Um, then there's an argument that fundamentally, if you raise the cost of higher education, maybe you are reducing the, the, the supply of high skilled graduates. And if that's the investment you need to maintain your global competitiveness, that's not a good buy. There's an interesting OECD uh, report which recently demonstrated that for every pound, I think they said euro or dollar, invested in higher education, actually that yields three pounds in terms of benefit to society and the economy. Um, then I've already mentioned this, privileging short-term choices, what students want to do now over what actually might make better sense in terms of their future career prospects. So we're all kind of Alistair Campbell style kind of sexing up our degree offerings because we need to attract students now. Um, 
Then there are the accounting tricks I've already mentioned. Actually, have we really reduced public spending here, or have we just kind of moved it around into different columns? Um, and then, crucially, there's the kind of erosion of the state's planning or steering capacity. Now, a lot of people say, that's good. We don't want the state to capacity, have any capacity to steer or plan the system. But ultimately, it is the state, in its many ways, that has built our higher education system. Um, we wouldn't have it if it hadn't been through state action. And also, I think even the most right-wing politicians are going to want to actually intervene in some kind of way. And then there's the whole issue of eligibility rules, checks, all that kind of growing tide of regulation, more intrusive regulation, that may well end up kind of drowning us. I'm going to skate through these much more quickly. Um, learning and teaching, where we're all aware of the drift towards interdisciplinary kind of study, and often that takes case even within the hidden context of disciplines themselves. Um, I've already mentioned earlier vocationalizing the academic. You know, if we're studying the humanities now, we have to bang on about how this is going to really prepare people for work in the creative industries and the cultural industries, even if we don't quite believe that's the reason you're studying history in the first place. Um, then there's the whole issue of unbundling courses and awards. I mean, I mean, we at the moment have a particular connection. We teach and we kind of make awards, uh, we examine, we make awards. You can actually separate all these functions and organise it in a quite different way. Um, Often a lot of the focus is on MOOCs, massive online open courses. But I think many of the most interesting things are the next point, which is revolution in communication and communicative culture. I mean, how people relate to each other. We're all aware of students texting all the time. We know how important Twitter and Facebook and all these things are. Um, it's actually revolutionizing the way. So I think it's these kind of low grade things that people access on their mobile, which are probably much, much more important than the big MOOCs. Research and knowledge transfer. Well, we strongly emphasize everything's got to be world class in terms of research. I rather worry about the phrase world class, um, but it's become almost obligatory. Uh, and we all talk about priorities. We've got to have pick the winners, um, even though we don't really know which the winners are going to be in the long term. Um, and we've got to concentrate, produce critical mass. We're all familiar with that kind of argument. But then at the same time, we're very keen to measure impact. We're very keen on promoting public and social engagement. And we talk about mode two distributed, kind of socially accessible knowledge. So there's kind of tensions there, I think, in our research agenda. Um, I'm actually going to skip over globalization because I'm taking too long. And I'm going to come to my conclusion. Globalization is very important, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just take it from me. <laughs> but take it from me also. It's got lots of upsides, but it's got lots of downsides as well. Um, so these are my final two slides. Um, are we facing a market revolution in higher education, a paradigm shift? Is it simply the kind of march of progress, a kind of a Whig view of the world, um, emphasizing perhaps deeper structural social change? Um, or is it the kind of final thing that things must change so that things can stay the same? You know, throw any reforms at us and we'll kind of uh, neuter them and... Uh, continue to do what we want to do anyway. Well, I suspect the future is going to be a bit of all those. And that's how it's always going to be, really. Um, there's never going to be a single path of development. Now, the proportion, I can't judge. You will be able to judge that as well as I. And this is my final, final thought. Are we going to face a familiar landscape or another country? Now, a familiar landscape comes in two versions. <coughs> Familiar landscape could be essentially the kind of system we have at the moment, which is essentially still a public system, not necessarily in its funding, although it is very public in its funding still largely, um, but certainly in, in its ethos and what we think we're trying to do. Um, or will it be the other familiar landscape, a kind of a single path of development? There's only one future that's open to us, and that is to embrace the market. So even within the familiar landscape, there's kind of two versions and quite an interesting tension there which you're going to feel. But then we flip over and say, another country. What would another country look like? Well, one, one element might be that actually we, we begin to envisage or perhaps re-envisage higher education institutions however they're organized, as kind of learning communities, not as skills factories. Um, 
I would like to think that we could do that, because I think that's what actually students ultimately value. Of course they want to get good jobs and useful, marketable qualifications, but they also actually want to learn. And it's that appetite for learning, which I think is the thing that we perhaps could emphasise. Then perhaps we could shift away from this obsession with world-class research to a kind of a more social form of knowledge that's useful across our communities in a broader sense. Then perhaps our institutions will have to change. I mean, they, they, they haven't changed much at the moment. I mean, you know, you, you ring the changes, you have departments and faculties and colleges and then you swap them over and you move back again but nothing fundamentally changes sorry I'm probably speak out of term when I say that I'm sure you've had a major change reform <laughs> process here in Edgehill um, but maybe we're going to face it just actually having to organize different kinds of university entirely and then maybe we are going to move away from this obsession with putting everyone in a hierarchy I mean the great English sin I think is that we can't embrace diversity and difference without immediately putting it into some form of hierarchy and ranking. And the moment you do that, of course, you destroy the appetite and the potential for creating diversity and difference. Now, which of those? Is it going to be a familiar landscape or another country? Well, again, I'm going to fudge that by saying, well, I think it's, it's going to be both, really. Um, I would like to feel that some of these elements that I've listed under another country will actually come into our vision of higher education in 2025. Um, I hope, and here obviously I'm exposing my own prejudices, I hope we will defend the public idea of the university, the public university, not in a sense of being publicly funded necessarily, but the idea of the public funding. Often we use the kind of word the state, which is kind of a nasty word, but of course the old English word for the state was the commonwealth. I mean, we once had a Commonwealth of England, of course, in this, after the Civil War. And, of course, some American states still preserve this in there. You have the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's a very strong idea that we actually, it's a Commonwealth. And I'd like to, that's my view of the public. So I'd like to feel we preserve that. As you've probably gathered, I'm a bit more sceptic about this constant drive towards only market solutions. But I think they're kind of diminishing they narrow the potential of higher education. And I think the whole point of higher education, the whole point of a proper university education, is to expand what is possible, perhaps sometimes to think now what is now impossible but will be possible in the future. Thank you. I didn't hear that. What is your view on unconditional offers? Well, I mean, at one level, I think it's logical. I mean, if you have faith in the students, particularly if you've interviewed a student or they've come to an open day, so there's been some contact with the university, um, uh, I think making an unconditional offer and trusting, you know, the kind of the views of teachers and FE lecturers who've actually kind of um, uh, uh, estimated their grades. Um, I think in a way that should be enough. I think it puts an awful lot of pressure on it. It produces this extraordinary circus where people have just missed their grades and then the university has to decide whether, you know, two A's and a, a C is as good as two, as one A and two B's and all these kind of equations that we have to make. I, I would support unconditional offers as much as possible. Because I think our system just produces too much last-minuteism. And last-minuteism is bad because sometimes students end up in a university they had never envisaged and never heard of, probably. And that's not a good basis for a kind of relationship for the future. I think you build the relationship with the student by actually having confidence and making an unconditional offer. Not, every, not all the time, but generally. Second question. Last. 
You mentioned uh, MIT, Harvard, Stanford and a number of other US institutions who we try and compete with. It seems to me that they're heavily supported by their alumni. So yeah, I guess my yeah. question is, why don't we seem to do it, <laughs> my impression anyway, is quite so well in the UK as they do elsewhere? Especially the US. Well, I think, I think there's a big social difference. I mean, um, uh, uh, it's very interesting the case of Oxford and Cambridge. Much the most generous alumni are actually Americans who've actually been at those two universities. Um, and that's why they spend an awful lot of time going to, uh, you know, dinners in New York and Washington and so on, because that's where the money is. I think the problem is that we still have a, a kind of broadly European view that we sort of, this is a public service, we've paid our taxes, and actually, if we start giving money, it will just let the government off the hook somehow. Now, the problem with that equation is we don't like paying taxes anymore either. So there's a, there's a bit of a flaw in our attitude. Um, but uh, I mean, I think it's important to kind of um, engage with your anomaly, but not first and last just to get money out of them, but actually to continue a relationship with them. And who knows, you might get lucky. Um, uh, I don't really, frankly, see much prospect of UK universities in the foreseeable future getting the kind of income from alumni that the major American universities do. And of course you can exaggerate because I mean many of the major American universities they just get money from an awful lot of people. I mean they get it from their alumni but they get it from their state government, they get it from fees, they get, they're just much richer than we are. Mm. And it shows, you get what you pay for frankly. You know. Final question. Neoliberalism has proved to be very resilient I mean, even you know, with the financial crash uh, of recent years and things. I mean, if we're not going to have a familiar landscape, but we are going to move to another country, as you mm -hmm. state that, I mean, what do you see in terms of higher education institutions? I mean, how do they consciously resist you know, a neoliberal path? Yeah. Well, that's a really big question to end with. And I, <laughs> I think I'll need to spend even more time trying to answer it. Um, I think the problem we face is that although, although we apparently have very adversarial politics in this country, actually the policy differences are not that great. There's actually really quite a narrow consensus. And in a way, I think that's one of the lessons of the Scottish referendum campaign. That's why many people in Scotland have voted yes. Not because they were kind of tartan nationalists or anything like that. I mean, I mean, the Scots have always disliked the English. Nothing's changed there. Um, but, uh, but because they felt there was a kind of a Westminster Whitehall view of the world, a London view of the world, I might say, actually, which was very dominant. And as dominant probably in Labour as it is in the Conservatives. Um, and the possibility of thinking outside that box had become more and more difficult. Now, I would say that universities have a responsibility as critical institutions, encouraging people to adopt a critical view of the world, to try and think outside that box. In a sense, that's where I end it. Um, I'd like to be confident. <laughs> I'm not sure how confident I am. Thank you, Peter. And what I'd like to do is invite Linda Brady, Pro Vice Chancellor, Student Experience. Thank you, Thank you very much, Peter. I mean, I, I think it's traditional at the end of these things to say it was very thought provoking. Um, so I will say it and mean it, to very sincerely. Um, I think that though everyone in this room is engaged in higher education um, to some extent, or at least interested in it, and it probably has been um, for a number of years looking at the, uh, the age profile of the audience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and I think actually it was very reassuring to see the scale of the change that we've been through. We can debate whether it's paradigm or just um, fundamental, but actually it is a very significant scale. And actually, I think you, you demonstrated that individually as institutions and as a sector, we've been incredibly resilient and responsive to those changes. And it's almost, you know, okay, so just bring it on, whatever the next thing is. Um, and, and that's where the scenarios, I think, are helpful. So I would have been slightly unnerved if you'd have had the answer to how it was going to be in 2025. Um, and I think, you know, the use of scenarios um, to demonstrate the fact that we just need to be able to respond. Um, to whatever it is, and not only to respond, but you know, it is our duty to help, you know, to help form the future and to shape the future, and so to be engaged politically, economically, socially, locally, globally. Um, you know, as as learning institutions, and I think that came across very strongly. So, so thank you very much. It's been an absolutely invaluable contribution.
to our series of um, IFP lectures and there's a plug because there's more, more coming so please have a look at the website. Um, we will pencil you in if that's okay for um, September 2025 just to do the reflection <laughs> on this. Um, so, you know, a huge thank you for making the journey um, to Ormskirk. You know, lots of people don't know where it is, so thank you for finding us and coming to see us. Um, and we hope you'll come back and we hope that everybody will join us for food and drink. But one more round of applause for Peter. Thank you.